What if a conversation could change your mind about yourself and about the world? What if a conversation could one day lead to a change in government policy? I'm Dr. Mark Halloran, and you're listening to Deep Trouble. So we're here to talk about Deep Trouble, which is a social work podcast which was originally produced by uh, Trouble magazine and which has been played through 94.9 Main FM. I've got Steve Proposh here, who's the editor of Trouble magazine, and I just wanted to start off by asking, what was your interest in starting this podcast? Why did you want to do this? When you approached me with the idea for a podcast that was a psychological therapy session essentially using Socratic questioning it just fit perfectly with my ideal for covering those subjects in depth things that we don't normally cover we can essentially interview a great range of people why did you want to start it well I thought that a lot of the discussions that are had are quite partisan uh, whether it's socially or politically and I know that it's been commented on and in one of the podcast episodes when I talked with Tim Costello he talks about the rapid retribalization of people through social media and I felt as though people were really only hearing what was relayed back to them through the echo chambers that are created by social media And so within psychology, there is uh, a phenomenon called confirmation bias. And so what happens is that people will ear towards information that confirms their beliefs while disregarding or potentially attacking the information that may invalidate their beliefs. And I believe that's a problem. I think it's always been a problem. I think we've always split ourselves into groups and that there's an issue in terms of in-group versus out-group behaviour. And so I wanted to use some of the techniques that I've learnt through psychology and through therapy, such as Socratic questioning and dialectical behaviour therapy. This idea around understanding, particularly in terms of dialectics, that if you have a thesis, if there is an idea, then there is an opposite to that idea. There is an antithesis. And I think it was interesting, the potential to explore that with public figures who may be artists, writers, scientists, politicians. It was an interesting opportunity for me to explore the way that we think. We need to move out of groupthink and start to think about things more deeply and be open to conversations that are more dialectical. I think people want the deep conversation. Podcasts and radio shows, they give the opportunity for an hour-long conversation, an hour-long session where you can get deep. Yeah, well, I think that we've discovered that people are able to listen to long-form conversation. That the rise that we're seeing at the moment of the public intellectual, so people who are packing out arenas for two intellectuals to debate one another, shows us that people have the ability to listen to complex ideas over long periods of time. I think in terms of politics, in terms of the tribalisation, and we have now a growing rift between... I suppose, conservative ideas and and socially progressive ideas, what we call the alt-right and the far left or the alt-left. I think that that's always gone on to some extent. I think that we've always formed groups. Or my memory of my parents around them talking about not being able to marry a Protestant, Catholics and Protestants at war with one another. Mm. I think this occurs because people aren't able to listen and to find the commonality and or simply disagree with one another and we're now moving into a space where we've got the the issues with the conservative media but in terms of maybe the more progressive media or the far left or 
to some extent there's a factor or a section of that called the regressive left where the idea that that ideas are dangerous and that we can't discuss ideas and so we simply silence people rather than the idea that if I disagree with an idea that you put forward then it really is my responsibility to formulate the argument to show you at least why I think this idea is erroneous. If I silence you then I send a signal to a lot of people that follow you that the idea that you have put forward is dangerous, but also that it may be true. And when you silence someone, it's untested. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so I think the greatest challenge for us when we continue with this podcast is for us to actually engage a range of different voices and I think probably conservative voices. Absolutely. Join me in the centre is what I want to say. <laughs> well, yeah, let's, uh, let's develop a, uh, a radical centre as I've heard a politician <laughs> yeah, like once that. say. It comes back to the confirmation bias that I was talking about before, but it also comes back to what I think the issue is, and I may be wrong, but I think we're afraid of emotion in our culture. So when we talk about, and I've been to conferences where there's been talks about mental health issues or suicide, and, and people have said, well, there were people who were upset by that and we should have had warnings, trigger warnings, that this content would be upsetting. But the issue is that we're uncomfortable with the fact that people are upset. Mm. You see, we're living in a culture which has become sanitised and that we don't recognise that it's okay to be grief-stricken, that grief is a normal response or distressed or sad. We kind of pathologise everything it's in the same way we sanitise death. I mean, when I went to India and I went to Varanasi and I went to the burning ghats and I stayed in a hotel outside there and they were cremating bodies in front of me uh, or washing bodies down on the Ganges... We've lost something there Absolutely, in terms yeah. of, and it really just speaks to our idea that you should never be, that there are negative emotions and there are positive emotions. And essentially, and this is what I do a lot in terms of my therapeutic work, people feel as though we need to ablate the negative emotions because we don't like to experience them. Mm, mm. They're uncomfortable, they're painful. Uh, and we want to have positive emotions. But we miss the fact that in life, the human experience the painful emotions are as valid and they teach us as much. We don't have to like them. No. The way that we segregate our emotions and try to control some and remove them and reduce them, and I understand them because they're unpleasant and painful. Yeah. But the idea also is if you meet someone who has managed to get rid of sadness and get rid of grief, this is a really interesting thing, it's a numbing, it's a dissociation. They will not experience any, their, all their emotions will go. If you take yep. away one, they'll all go. That's interesting, um, isn't it? And so some of the therapeutic techniques, such as acceptance and commitment therapy, are around reintroducing those emotions and reintroducing the emotions so that we can accept that sometimes that we're, we experience sadness and grief and pain and we also experience joy. Right, Mark. So we're uh, here today to talk with Georgia Banks, who's an artist uh, who has a show coming up in the Fringe Festival this year. Um, the work is called Please Tell Me What My Work Is About. Uh, what might you be discussing with Georgia today? I'll be talking with Georgia about her personal history, about her experiences as a woman, and about feminism. Right, so George's show is based on another artist's work, Lee Lozano, who essentially excluded women from her life for the later part of her life, from peers to, to waitresses, to everybody. She just stopped talking to women. What's George's spin on this? George is asking members of the community to be involved in her performance and tell her what her work is about. The only criteria is that if you want to be involved, you need to be male, straight and white. 
And so she's deliberately excluding women, people from the queer community and ethnic minorities. Right. So this work is as much about who it excludes as to who it includes. And that's what it's bringing light about. This is going to be really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Let's go. What if a conversation could change your mind about yourself and about the world? What if a conversation could one day lead to a change in government policy? I'm Dr Mark Halloran, and you're listening to Deep Trouble. Could you tell me about your childhood? My childhood? Oh my goodness, where to start? Where did you grow up? I've always had difficulty with this question. I I moved around a lot. So I was born in London and then moved to Australia when I was three (laughs) to Broken Hill. And then after that, it was Cobar and then it was Burnie in Tasmania, then Mount Isa in Queensland, then Auckland in New Zealand, then Monkey Mire in WA, then Perth in WA, then back to Broken Hill for a year, then Sydney, then Adelaide, and now Melbourne. Was there a reason for moving around so much? Yeah, um, for the for the younger parts of my life, pre-high school or up until the end of high school, it was um, mining mostly. My mother's partner and, bo- and my father both were in the mining industry, so, you know, you move right. to where the, the work is. And then after that, maybe I was just in the habit of moving, so I just kept doing it. <laughs> Nomadic. Yeah. Because I think one of your artworks was done in Broken Hill, I think. That's right, yeah, my, um, my crucifixion. Right. So that was a reenactment of oil work by Chris Burden called Transfixed, where he was crucified to the back of a VW Beetle, um, and I was crucified to the back of a broken-down, dilapidated Ford Ute in the in the desert out in Broken Hill. Was there significance of doing that at Broken Hill? Yeah, yeah. I was really interested in doing the work back in my back in my hometown, out in that really quintessential Australian landscape because because the landscape is a fairly masculine field within the visual arts. So I was really interested in contributing to that dialogue in an almost guerrilla feminist kind of way by reenacting the work of such a a masculine person such as Burden, whose work is very very macho. I mean, he was. He was Jesus, <laughs> self-proclaimed. <laughs> what was your experience of growing up in the time that you spent in Broken Hill? So it's um it's interesting because even though I only lived in Broken Hill from like the ages of three to six and then 17 to 18, my family's from Broken Hill. My dad was born there, his mum was born there, her mum was born there. So although I didn't live there for my entire life, it does feel like home to me in a in an ancestral sense I suppose you've got ties yeah and my family still lives there so it's probably where I go home to you know it's where I go to see my family oh what's your father like oh he's beautiful I love him so much he (laughs) he'll kill me for saying this but he he cries during something like the voice whenever one of the contestants talks about her relationship with her father or how much she loves her father. You catch him out of the corner of your eye having a little teary. <laughs> We're an emotional bunch. <laughs> because of his relationship with you. Yeah, he's got four daughters and one granddaughter. Absolutely right. no boys in the family. And he's just the biggest teddy bear. Why are you so close? Maybe you've got to be close to someone... Actually, you know what, maybe it's because we didn't live together a lot growing up and it's it's easy to idolise a parent in that way. My parents separated when I was 10. Right. And then my mum moved us away from where my dad was living when I was 13 or 14. Right. And then I, um, I stopped living with my mum when I was 17 and moved back in with my dad, but only for a year. And then I was off, right. off visiting places and then off to university in Sydney. It sounds like that might have been a difficult time, like your parents separating when you were 10. I mean, it, it was no more difficult than anybody's parents separating. I think it was maybe the partners that they the subsequent went partners. to afterwards. My, my mother's partner was quite abusive. Right. And 
abusive of to of, me towards you. Yeah, and my mum was not really. She never believed me at first, and then when she did right. believe me, she never really supported me, and that's why I moved out. Actually, I mean, moved out slash kind of got kicked out slash made an ultimatum and right. sort of told my mum, if you don't leave him, I'm going to leave, and she said, well, leave then. It seems as though that the crucifixion is in relation to your experiences growing up. Uh, that's interesting because I've never thought about it that way because that crucifixion is a part of a long line of works that I did where I was reenacting works by very prominent men right. in the performance art scene. And as a woman exploring how reenactment can be used as a radically feminist act. Right. Um, I guess I'd never really thought about my... I, ne- I haven't really thought about my work a lot in relation to my my personal history because I do come at my work via academia and, mm. like, fairly heavily conceptual crap. <laughs> the personal's political. Sure, to some maybe extent. my interest in feminism wouldn't be there if I hadn't, you know, lived the life that I've lived. So in that regard, yeah, I suppose every work I make is related to my history. I suppose mm. every work that everybody makes is related to their history because it's what brings us to where we are today i probably wouldn't have gone to art school at all if the stuff hadn't happened to me because it was a, a way for me to to explore and express at a very young age i had an art teacher who took an interest in me and that felt good i suppose it was nice. replacing that parent which is what i needed when i looked at your work and some of it's confronting there seems to be a focus on uh, cutting. That series of works was about um, how within performance art, the wound, because wounding in performance art is very prevalent. All of those videos that involve bloodletting are reenactments of works from the 60s and right. the 70s. And it's about how the wound can operate as a document of a performance in the same way that a photograph or a video of a performance can. But it's a document that exists in a state of flux because it's forever changing, because it exists on the literally on the body of the artist. Whereas a, a photo is a document that exists in a state of stasis because it just captures that one single moment. Yes. And so I was accessing and reenacting seminal works through through the wound specifically. So crucifixion is one the branding. Um, yes, on which par. is yeah. That was a that's a Mike Parr work where he he did brand himself with the word artist. Yeah. yeah. I also did another burden called shoot. He was shot in the arm with a rifle. Right. I had two parts of my arm removed with a biopsy punch to uh, simulate the wounding that he had, but in a very right. different way, in a very, um, maybe in a more female way, very slow, very penetrative. It was sort of about really pulling pulling apart, not recreating necessarily, but using the original work as a framework for discussing my own my own interests i suppose like feminism and also uh, um agency i think that a lack of agency is something that comes up in my work a lot it's giving my agency to somebody else to the viewer or to the doer i suppose i've experienced powerlessness my whole life in those very prevalent and traumatic experiences but also just as a woman in life every day yeah um Definitely, especially when I was younger. Um, yeah, it's it's everywhere. You right. always feel it. I still feel it. I get so angry at myself sometimes that I still feel afraid to walk home late at night. Right. And I still have Carry that. your keys, know where your keys are. Yeah. Potentially yeah. Use, you can use your keys as a weapon. And it crosses my mind all the time, you know, like this person could hurt me. Well, it's dangerous being a woman. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, you can't escape it. No. I do want to talk about that more, about being a woman and feminism. I guess I was interested when I saw your work, the work where you were cutting your hair and cutting into your back with the, oh, with the razor her. blade. Yes. Her. Um, and this was around, uh, I think you called it a, an anti or reverse Samson, that the, the gaining of power could be to remove the hair because you're removing femininity. Yeah, that's right. There's a very, very long tradition exploring the limits of the human body both physically and emotionally and psychologically within performance art 
And maybe yes. maybe it interests me because of my own personal history. Right. But You experience it differently though. Yeah, it's not like I put a lot of work into them, a lot of consideration for my yeah. own safety, for making sure nothing's going to go wrong. There's often medical stuff there. Right. I've at least discussed, yes. you know, anything that involved bloodletting. So the so emotional I had a nurse experience present. is different. Yeah, it's very, it's very different. Yeah, and it is about exploring those concepts of of feminism and of reperformance. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 like a means to an end. It's not like I want to do this work because I want to hurt myself. Yes. Most of the time, I almost back out at the last second. Like, why? Right. Am I? I don't want to do this. This is gonna hurt. But that's the most interesting part to me. Is that like, it's not the most interesting part. Sorry, that is. An interesting part yes. to me is that instinct of self-preservation, but then letting that go as an artist is its really interesting. It's really hard. So, I mean, yes. I guess making the work that I make, it's very much literally and metaphorically sort of splaying myself out for the audience. It feels like a confession. Sometimes, yeah. It's interesting how often Christianic things come up in relation to my work when I was raised. So, um, so atheist, but I think it's just a, it's just a stand-in for the patriarchy, Christianity. Right. <laughs> yeah. Talking about the history of wounding and that it occurred in the sixties. Oh yeah, in performance art, and also you know forever and ever, there's been there's been mark making on the body. Like um, penitence, like yeah, uh, the and Spanish also penitence. within um, within communities, tribes, and stuff like that. That yes. that marking that we are we are one. Part of rites of passage as well. There's been a lot of mark making on the skin to um, to signify moving from childhood to adulthood or anything like that. So. Right. Was it predominantly men doing wounding in that scene in the in the sixties? There were definitely women doing it as well. Jill right. Orr, Marina Abramovich, uh, Valet Export uh, are all very um, incredible female performance artists from that era. Right, because uh, it seemed as though you were talking about recreating some of these pieces as a way of feminising them. Yes, yeah, and that is something that I was interested in specifically with the work of Parr and, and Burden, for example. But I have also reenacted the work of, of women as well, Abramovich and Ballet Export, for example. Is the wounding for women different to the wounding for men? That's an interesting question. I feel like maybe with regard to reenacting the work of women, it's almost about like updating the the dialogue surrounding the work. Like maybe it's like a reminder, like this issue is still relevant. Right. <laughs> Let's keep talking about it. Right. The issue. <laughs> yeah, the, like feminism and the work of these women and right. the ways that they were exploring the the female body and the woman in in relation to right. maybe the art world or just the world. When men wound themselves versus when women wound themselves, is there something different about that? Yeah, there is. I mean, in its purest sense, it feels it feels the same. But I do find that women's work is generally the work that these women were doing was very feminist. Right. And that immediately gives it a different feeling because it is exploring feminism. And so even just the way that it's viewed and discussed within the mainstream immediately, it becomes different. It almost becomes relegated to to being feminist. What does that um, mean? Well, like if a guy does it, it, it can mean anything. Can it? Well, you know what I mean? Like it's it's seen as this work that means this thing, whatever the artist says it means. Mm. I don't know, I feel like often within being a female artist, you're expected to be either a feminist artist or you're very like actively not a feminist artist or something like that. Are there people who are actively not feminist artists? It's almost like, you know, even when I was younger, when I was making work, I would say, I'm not a feminist artist, I'm just an artist. Right. You know? <laughs> why, why did you feel the need to make that distinction? Well, because that's what that's almost what we're told to do. I remember in the first year of my undergraduate degree, I had a lecturer who was like, so you, you need to decide if you want to be a feminist artist and you yes. need to decide if you want to be a queer artist and you need to decide if you want to be an artist of colour yeah. and it will get you into those, like, specialist shows but you might right. get left behind by the real art world. Right. Um, so it's almost like 
Well, it's almost like Function- play the game. Functional identity politics. Yeah, yeah, and it's very it's very prevalent within the art world. You know, there are always feminist shows that you can be a part of or, or shows that focus on people of colour or shows that focus on the queer community. And, you know, why can't we just be in shows? <laughs> What's your experience of feminism? What are your principles in terms of being a feminist? I do. I do identify as a feminist. Of course I do because I believe in equality. Um, That's, I mean, in its purest sense, that's all feminism is. I mean, feminism can mean so many different things to so many different people and none of them are incorrect, really. In my own pursuit, that's the word, of being a feminist, it's very much about let's Let's make everything fair. Let's, and it's not just about, you know, white women, which I know that is, a, is an issue with, you know, like old school feminists like Jermaine yes. Greer, who's very transphobic, for example. Right. So his focus is very much on cisgendered women, which I, I don't right. agree with. Because she's a second wave feminist. Radical. It is interesting raising Jermaine Greer because she was recently deplatformed from the Adelaide Writers Festival. She's written an essay called On Rape because she'd done previously one called On Rage and I think that was about Aboriginal men or the the issues with rage within the community. Do you think that she should be deplatformed? Yeah, I do. I don't agree with her views and I don't think she should be given access to a platform because I don't agree with what she's saying. Although, you know, we're all... That's tough because we're all entitled to our own opinions, aren't we? But I don't know why she would be given the responsibility of educating new people because her views are outdated now. She is transphobic and Mm. she is very focused on a cis white feminism that I I don't agree with. You don't identify with. It is a difficult one. I know that another prominent Australian feminist, Clementine Ford, was deplatformed from speaking at Lifeline. Yeah, she's um, been in a lot of trouble recently. Right. I don't know why. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I did hear about this on the grapevine. Yeah, because uh, she had tweeted something to the effect of, and I don't know if I've got this correct, but kill all men. She said she'd done, and obviously done facetiously. Sure. Do you think that she should be deplatformed? I mean, that is inflammatory. No, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. Mm. I mean, I don't think we should kill all men, but I, yeah. I understand that that's a, a rally cry that it's really it's to be taken with a grain of salt. She's not Solana. She's not actually going to go out there and shoot Warhol, <laughs> you know? No. She doesn't think you're all turds. Sure. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I'm interested in this because I guess they're still just ideas, aren't they? I mean, some of those ideas are dangerous uh, or they, yeah. they seem like dangerous ideas, but they're still just ideas that people can have. I wonder if Jermaine Greer is educating me or whether she's just expressing a controversial idea, like a provocateur. The idea behind Clementine Ford's tweets is just to be a provocateur. Yeah, I don't understand why there's... I mean, it feels like there's a distinction there that maybe I'm not quite capable of grappling with, but I do think that Jermaine Greer does believe those things because she's been touting this for a, for a long time. Yes. And has been exclusionary to the trans community. And come, as far as I know, Clementine Ford hasn't killed any men. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's practising it. And this is, this is what Jermaine Greer does practise. But I suppose Clementine Ford is is hurting somebody, but maybe it's this idea of like, you know what, I think Jermaine Greer is punching down, you know. She's punching at the people that are below yeah. her. It's almost like she's finding her position within the hierarchy, which is I'm here and I'm going to try to fight my way to the top. But while I'm doing it, I'm going to hurt the people that are beneath me, that have yes. less rights than me, yes. which seems distinctly anti-feminist to me. This is Deep Trouble and you are listening to Mark Halloran in conversation with Georgia Banks. What's your experience of being a woman? We talked about that a little bit earlier, but we we left it at a particular point and you were talking about the idea of being afraid. Yeah, yeah, I feel, I feel afraid, you know. It bothers me, it bothers me because I feel like I am strong. Yes. But I am also fearful. Right. Which makes me really angry at, I don't know if I'm angry at myself or I'm angry at everybody else for making me have to be afraid. And then there's this level of like not being believed or listened to. Yes. I remember I was walking home from the gym one day and there was a guy walking on the same side of the street as me, but 
in the opposite direction and he passed me and then he turned around and he started walking behind me. Yes. So he'd very like consciously changed the direction that he was moving in to follow me. Right. And so I felt afraid. I spotted a young guy getting out of his car across the street. So I ran across the street and I said, there's a guy, he's following me. I don't live that far away. Do you mind just walking with me until he leaves me alone or until I'm at my front door? Yes. And he sort of looked at me like I was crazy. Right. And then he said, well, I feel like if I walk with you now, he might damage my car. Right. <laughs> but that's- that, was, that was what he said. He was more concerned with the safety of his car than my life. Yeah. <laughs> and no, this the- guy during this conversation had stopped across the street and was quite clearly waiting for me right. as well. It was, yeah. I've worked in non-government organisations and uh, worked with women and women who've been suffered domestic abuse and worked with perpetrators. Uh, and one day they were doing some domestic violence training, but they asked a question of the room and they said, put up your hand if you've walked to the car at night and been concerned about being attacked and you've taken your keys and put them between your fingers. Yeah. And all of the women put their hands up. Yeah. And that was probably when I realised the difference. It is something that we just take for granted. Yeah, and I think that's in the Me Too movement has been quite revelatory in that sense as well yeah. because I was like every single woman has a story. That involves assault or harassment yes. um, to varying degrees. But I'd, I'd say there's not a single woman on the face of this planet that hasn't had somebody at least wolf whistle at them or say yes. something to them as they were just walking down the street. And then all the way up to being raped and assaulted. Yeah, we all have at least at least one. I mean, I can think of many. And they shape our lives from a very young age. Yes. You know? So I did a work recently called Hello Boys where I was on Periscope, which is Twitter's live streaming platform. And as I was performing, anyone could comment anything as it unfolded live. So anywhere from all over the world. And, you know, there was lots of like hitting it from that angle and you have a nice ass. (laughs) We could say we're in America probably. Yes. (laughs) And I suppose just shining a light on it is, is subverting it. Or like it's almost like you're... You're, bring it to the surface. Yeah, and you're pandering to it in order to bring it into a, into a perspective, to prioritize it within a conversation that's happening, where it's like this is what's happening to women online all the time. I open Instagram, people send me pictures of their dicks that I've never spoken to, that I have no idea who they are. Right. Is you that know? in relation to that work? No, just- that's just something that happens to women online. Right. <laughs> Maybe you could delve into this a little bit more, the... The impulse behind sending somebody a picture of your penis and whether it's an aggressive act or whether you really think it's going to lead to some kind of sexual tryst. That objectification of women is something that I explore a great deal. Works I've done that explore the relationship between food, sex and feminism, it's about that idea of not only do women become objects but they become consumables, something to be consumed. I did an exhibition called Get Some, made up of a few video works and also a performance lecture. And that related to Oppenheim's work where she had covered a saucer and cup and a spoon with fur. Yeah. And, and you had talked about all of the analogies that are drawn online between female genitalia and... And food. And there's yeah. so many. Yeah. There's so many. And I'm sure you know lots of them. Meat drapes, honey pot. Uh, I didn't know those. Beef cuttons. Right. What else? Oh, my God. Like hot pocket and like, you know, how it looks like a, like a sideways taco and like, yeah. And even if it's a joke, it's, it's, it is degradation. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's intentional or not, but there is a lot of aggression around discussing female sexuality and female anatomy. How do we talk to one another? It's, it's difficult because I feel like we're in a place right now where women are, just sick of this, you know, yes. sick, sick of, of having to be afraid and we're talking about it and that's great yes. and it's making men feel picked on, mm. which is making them angry and we're angry and they're angry and everybody's just so angry, angry. <laughs> angry. Yeah. and it's really not getting us anywhere yet. Yeah. But I do think it's the start of something yeah. because it's being talked about. Yes, and that's all I want to do. I want to contribute to that conversation.
I feel frightened to say things all the time, to point to issues that we have. Even this work that I'm doing now, it's it's risky for me because I can make people very angry with, mm. with me and it can be it can be a bit dangerous. Yeah. But, you know, what I'm really interested in is pointing to a system that favours one way of being and saying, well, this isn't, this isn't right. Mm. And I hope that in doing that, at least it's it's the start of something. It's shining a light on a problem. And then maybe further down the line we can have a discussion about how to change it. But right now we just need everyone to get on board with the fact that it's a problem. Yes. You know? <laughs> Your latest work, which is uh, you've asked straight white men to comment on it. Yes, to tell me what my work is about. Right. Yeah. So maybe you could explain the purpose of that. Oh, well, the performance hasn't started yet. Hasn't started It's between yet. the 12th and the 22nd of September. Right. So the work is you can sit down. You, you can either make an appointment to sit down with me face-to-face right. and tell me what my work is about or you can do it online, which is 100% anonymous. So right. you can say whatever you want and there's absolutely no way for that to come back to you. So there's two different ways that this work operates within right. two different frameworks. Because you also had a work where you, I think it was to kind of um, emulate what goes on with dating apps uh, like Tinder, but the difference was that people contact you by phone. Oh, intercourse with the artist. Intercourse with the artist. Yeah, which I did earlier this year for Fola and anyone could phone me for 48 hours. So I had phone calls for 48 hours straight. From mostly men, a few women, but most mostly men. What were the conversations like? Because I think you said that the idea was that we're so used to kind of texting people or sending people messages, but it, it feels like a very different experience to talk to a stranger. Yeah, and there's a higher level of intimacy, I suppose, to talking on the phone rather than talking in messages or talking on social media. Because I think we dehumanize each other on the internet pretty easily. Yes. Like, we're, it's very easy to be abusive to somebody on the internet and not think about them as a human being, how that's going to affect them. And I was interested to see if that would be different on the phone. Right. And I'd say it was. People felt very connected to me. I didn't necessarily feel that connection because I was talking to a lot of people over a very long period of time and I was very, very tired by the end of it. But I had people calling over and over again. I had a guy who called four times during the performance and I only know this because the last time he phoned me, he started speaking to me about something and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, sorry. And he said, well, I've phoned three times before. Like, you should know who I am by now. He felt like there was already intimacy there. It felt like I owed him something, yeah. And I had a guy message me afterwards who said, this is the most meaningful connection I've felt with somebody all day. And I was like, I don't know which one you are. Because I spoke to so many people. And I had people messaging me afterwards. What do you think people's motivation would be to do this? Maybe curiosity? I don't know. I mean, I had a fair few people hang up on me when they realized it wasn't phone sex. Right. (laughs) Pretty abruptly too, like mid-sentence, boop, they're gone. Oh, right. okay, bye. Because <laughs> it's a strange thing to talk to a stranger. I mean, I worked yeah. on Lifeline for two years and yeah. getting a phone call at three in the morning from someone who's lonely or possibly suicidal yeah. is a strange experience. I can imagine. So I think you must have had strange conversations. Yeah, I did have some strange conversations. Uh, funnily enough, I had a lot of guys call me and tell me what they thought my work was about. <laughs> really? Yes. Was that part of the inspiration then to move yeah, on to the- Yeah, partly no. inspire this new What work. did they think your work was about? It was little things like they'd be like, oh, do you know the artist Marina Abramovich? And I'd be like, yes, I do. And they'd be like, yeah, she's this artist that um, she did this work and I think it was called like – um, rhythm something and I'd be like yeah it's, it's rhythm this like and yes. like but they would continue to tell me even though it's like I clearly know more about this than you right. <laughs> or like have you ever considered the fact that your work might be quite feminist yes it is it's it's decidedly so because right. <laughs> it feels like when you're talking about it, you feel like that's entitlement that they that they're explaining it back to you when you're yeah. obviously yeah, the artist. Yeah, mansplaining. You're right, yeah. That's, that is a, uh, a new term. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, when I listen to it, I only listen to, I think there was a pre-recorded phone call on your site, it felt like loneliness. 
there was some component to it. Yeah, and maybe so. And that's something I had sort of um, was this idea that there's this access to somebody for 48 hours. You can say whatever you want to them, talk to them about whatever you want, and then it's gone. At the end of the 48 hours, that phone switched off, gone. I haven't turned it back on since. Right. So it's, yeah. And it, maybe it is about this kind of idea of um, selling intimacy. Intimacy is a commodity, which is something that is, you know, which is done. When we're online, it's so easy to, to dehumanize somebody and say whatever you, you want to them. Mm. I mean, when I did do that work on Tinder, I had a guy who one of the first things he said to me was, I can teach you how to take it up the ass." Right. And I said to him, I'm really interested in why you would feel like that's an okay thing to say to somebody you've never met. And he said, well, this isn't the real world. This is Tinder. It seems as though being anonymous changes things. It's also the group thing that when you have people online and they form a group, yep. we know that lynch mobs that people wouldn't do the things that they did, but they, they went through a process they called de-individuation. Yeah. And I think about de-individuation that happened where people did horrendous things in lynch mobs. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think add being anonymous to that. So, and it doesn't – but I think almost you don't need the, the gang because you, no. you, de, you de-individualize We de-humanize each other. Yeah. Yeah, we do, absolutely. And it's terrifying. <laughs> Because you wouldn't say that to somebody if you met them face to face. No. Well, I hope not. <laughs> Some people might. <laughs> they, may, they, may, they may have antisocial personality disorder if that were the case. But when we yeah. got into the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of it with that guy, it was that he felt like he'd faced so much rejection. He was like, why bother treating you like a human when women have been so horrible to me in the past? And by being horrible, he meant that they didn't want to date him. I suppose it's almost like it's so crazy right now. It's almost like we are just cutting everybody off at the knees a little bit where it's like, you know, people were like Harvey Weinstein fell and then a lot of actors were pulling out of films of Woody Allen's and then, you know, the next person and the next person. And maybe it needs to happen. It all needs to collapse so that it can be rebuilt into something better. You know, like I've had my own issues with um, with academics and stuff like that, lecturers and... Um, In terms of their behaviour. Yeah, and I didn't speak out about it very much. I mean, I told some close friends. Actually, I told a close male friend that one of my lecturers had done something pretty uh, questionable. Right. And he was like, well, I don't want to hear that. Almost like, I don't want to hear that because I don't want to have to do something about it or I don't want to hear that because I don't want to have to adjust my opinion of him, Mm. which seems to happen a lot around these things where these accusations are being made and it's met with a lot of like, no, I don't really want to know about this at first because before the whole Louis Louis A.K. thing sort of crumbled in and became what it is, there was years or decades or something where these women would have been just sort of like quietly telling each other, just watch out for that guy, you know. Um, so it's like a network. Yeah, or telling a close friend, like one comedian telling another close friend, a male comedian, like he did this and they're almost like, well, I don't want to know about that because I look up to him. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And so that's really tough for women as well in these situations is coming forward is hard and it is not mm. met with a lot of support. Belief. And so when people are coming forward, like, and then they're not being well believed, mm. I don't see a lot of changes being made on that really high up level and I think that at the moment we're just doing what we can with what we've got. This is Deep Trouble and you are listening to Mark Halloran in conversation with Georgia Banks. Um, I, I had another question. I'm just trying to think. Do you have any thoughts so far from what we've talked about? It's, it's intense. A lot of interviews I've done in the past have been just like, I remember I did an interview with a radio show where they were like, not really sure what a performance artwork was. They were right. like, so did you write this play and direct it? And I'm like, no, it's not a, it's not a play. They hadn't taken any interest in what it's they not, were. It's not a play. It's a performance. <laughs> it's oh. real. It happens in real life. One of the final questions in terms of the, com- the complexity. Uh, so one of Weinstein's accusers, Asia Argento, has been, yes. been accused now. So we have this difficult 
balance or intersection between somebody who's been perpetrated against and somebody who has, well, it, essentially she's had sex with an underage male and so it's statutory rape. Yep. And it sounds like it's beyond that as well because yep. – and but in that within that context, she is taking on a very masculine position because it's a child and she had – she had power over him. Right. And that's an interesting conversation as well because there are situations where I've consented to having sex with somebody because I felt like if I didn't, I could get into trouble or it could affect right. my, my life or my career or because they were in a position of authority over me. Right. There's actually, I read an article recently and they used a really excellent analogy where if you said to me, hey, do you want to go out to dinner? Yes. And I said... Yeah, sure. You know, you would say, oh, cool. Well, where do you want to eat? Or are you allergic to anything? Or right. do you, are you a vegetarian? What do you feel like? Like pizza or Indian? And this is the kind of conversation that we should be having around consent. And then she said, but imagine that's your boss. And your boss says, hey, do you want to go out to dinner tonight? And you had other plans, but it's your boss. Oh, yeah, okay. And he's like, great. Well, I want to eat sushi. Yeah. You're not going to say, oh, I don't eat fish because it's your boss. So even though you've consented to going out to dinner with them and to eating sushi, it's the power hierarchy is very different mm. there. And so I've had issues with that myself. So even if this boy did consent or didn't consent, either way, it's, it's not appropriate. It is sexual assault. And I think that's a conversation that needs to be happening more as well, you know, because I felt that as well, where I felt like I wasn't allowed to say... No, or I didn't have the agency to say no. Hmm. And so even though technically it was consensual, it didn't feel consensual, you know. And I think that's a conversation that needs to be happening more as well, is the responsibility of people in power not having sex with people yes. that have less power than them, unless there's a serious conversation that's happening around it first. You mentioned academia before. I mean, I, I, that's what I found surprising about academia when I worked there was that people were having relationships with students and things yeah. like that. And I think that's changed now that they've actually made it unethical, as they should have always. Yeah, it is, it is unethical. It is inherently unethical. I mean, we have an issue in terms of those when there are relationships based on employment and there is power, you know, in terms of like a therapy situation is a situation of power. That's why it's so inappropriate for a therapist, to, uh, yeah, even absolutely. though it goes on, to have a relationship with a client because it's not the natural form of the way the relationship begins. Yeah, and you so, think about how open a patient has made themselves to you to then yeah, it is, yeah. And the therapist doesn't tell the patient anything about, about them. themselves, yeah. Do you feel like there's a struggle then within a movement? I mean, obviously there's a lot of zeal uh, and, and particularly when things go online. Do you think that there's a difficulty in having a nuanced conversation about some of these issues? Maybe right now, yeah. I yeah. mean, I feel like we're talking in binaries a lot at the moment. Yeah, because it's kind of – it felt like, the, let's say, Asia had been delegated the role of the victim and then it's suddenly a massive – people kind of have to psychologically adjust to the fact that she may have also been a perpetrator. Yeah, and she, but she's both. When I was 13, I lost my virginity to a 28-year-old. Hmm. And when I was 28, I spent a lot of time thinking about that and thinking about how on earth a 28-year-old could be attracted to a 13-year-old. That's an illness. It's criminal behaviour to begin with. Yeah. And it's, it's not normative and damaging, Yeah. massively damaging. Yeah. Uh. And it can be difficult to have that conversation surrounding Asia's behaviours because it's like maybe she – had felt victimised her whole life and so she finally found herself in a position of power and behaved in the way that people in positions of power had behaved towards her yeah. all this time. But then that feels like I'm tr like we're trying to excuse what she did and there yeah. isn't an excuse for what she did. But, yeah, I mean, it's all, it's, I mean, I, all I, uh, it's messy. It's I guess I've struggled with it in terms of if you access something like CASA, um, which is the Centre Against Sexual Assault, you can do that, but if, if you've perpetrated as well after that, which does happen, you can no longer access the services. And so it's like right. withdrawal of support. I yeah. mean, there's, there's very good reasons for that because you don't want a perpetrator to encounter somebody that they're people perpetrated that are, against. Yeah, well, and also people that are vulnerable, I suppose. 
But it seems like when we do binaries, then suddenly the person loses any kind of empathy towards them. Yeah, yeah. And they are still trying to deal with their own sexual assault, which, yeah. you know, and maybe not being able to deal with that is worse because it could lead to further discrepancies. Yes. It's tough. I don't know. I'm just an artist. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, it's not just, is it? I mean... Well, yeah, and art operates as a mirror. So I can hold up a mirror and we can all look into it and maybe see what's wrong, but trying to initiate any kind of change is, is another step, which, you know, I'm definitely interested in, of course. I think that shining a light on the problems can help lead to, to opening up a conversation about how to change things. But then as an artist, again, you are speaking predominantly to people that already agree with you, which can be difficult. What's difficult about that? Uh, well, if you want to make change, you need you need to be reaching a broader audience maybe. You know, I suppose going to a group of people that are very left mostly and, you know, already believe in, in what I believe in and going, this is yeah. an issue, and they're going to say, yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I guess that it, it creates the effect of an echo chamber. So you never get the chance to test other people's ideas and you never get the chance to have your own ideas tested. Yeah. And that creates a kind of an orthodoxy which is comforting, but sometimes it creates other problems. Yeah, I mean, this work has been interesting even before it's happened because I am calling out a group of people that aren't used to being called out just yet. And they exist within my art world everywhere and um, right. are my friends, you know. I actually once had a, a friend of mine who's an artist who said that, you know, well, no one's knocking down my door to have shows. So, you know, it's basically he's saying that, like, feminism didn't really need to exist <laughs> or yeah. something because no one was knocking down his door to be in shows. You, know, you were getting preferential treatment or something. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Right. Um, and so I am already getting some rather... Um, bristled reactions right, from other artists yeah right. yeah i mean all of the straight white men that i've talked to about the show are a bit like oh well that's making fun of men which i don't think that it is making fun of men yes. i think they feel like they're being put on the spot to participate like if they're if they do participate they're going to be made fun of in some way what is the purpose i suppose it's more about like we are all operating within a framework that favours one narrative and one voice. Yes. And by participating in the project, you're just – you're agreeing that this framework is in place and that you are a part of it. And, you know, maybe it's it's about agreeing to, to change it because we can't really change it from the bottom. We need the people at the top to help to go, you know what, this As is – allies. This is – screwy yes and it needs to change but i can understand why you wouldn't want to change a system that you're at the top of because you'd be like well what's wrong with this this is maybe, this they, is don't, great. maybe they don't know how <laughs> yeah well yeah how and and yeah. why and also you know maybe they don't you don't always realize as much that something's going wrong if you're at the top of it you know because you can be like no everything's fine <laughs> I mean, I started to read more about feminism and I got to reading parts about feminism and uh, social constructionism and science and things like that. And one of my favourite philosophers and probably the person who is important and based my ideas in terms of empiricism on would be Aristotle. But Aristotle viewed women as sort of mutilated men. Yeah, Right. I begin to wonder how much of that informs a particular narrative. Yeah, and that's all this work is, is that there's, there is a, a narrative that is being prioritised within yes. the art world and it is that of straight white men. And yes. I'm not trying to point to anybody and, and be like, you, <laughs> you're the problem. You know, it's more like yeah. there is a problem. Let's all just agree that, that this is a problem. This is problematic for everybody. Because why do we want to keep hearing the same story over and over again? There's so many other stories and they all deserve as much attention, not just a show in March, you know? Because yeah. <laughs> you're deliberately excluding voices on this to show uh, something about power dynamics. You're excluding other groups. That's right, because their voices are being excluded from the world, from versions of history and from the shaping of now. It's a microcosm. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you. We, um, we might leave it there.
You've been listening to an interview with Georgia Banks. This is Deep Trouble on 94.9 Main FM. Georgia Banks' work for the Melbourne Fringe, please tell me what my work is about, is at Testing Grounds from the 12th to the 22nd of September. Testing Grounds on South Bank. Now you can go to the Melbourne Fringe site for more info. So Mark, who have we got next week on Deep Trouble? Next week we're going to interview Reverend Tim Costello, AO, who is currently the Chief Advocate of World Vision. Brilliant. Well, look, uh, thanks for listening to Deep Trouble on 94.9 Main FM. I'm Steve Proposh. And I'm Dr. Mark Halloran. And this is Deep Trouble.